A couple running away together is a tale as old as time, often sweetly portrayed in the romantic dramas we see on TV and the fairy tale books we read. However, there have been endless cases across the last century which involve couples suddenly disappearing under much more eerie circumstances. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two spine-tingling cases of couples who vanished into thin air. But first, I'd like to thank Hunt A Killer for sponsoring today's episode. A troubling, unsolved disappearance spirals into a harrowing cold case homicide when Julia Adler stumbles upon the decomposed body of a legendary actress from the 1930s in a theatre owned by her family for generations. The theatre's calculated board of directors attempt to remove Julia from their future and the theatre's reputation takes a turn for the worse, thus leaving her with no choice but to appoint you as lead investigator, uncovering the hidden truths as you attempt to crack the coldest case the world of true crime has ever seen. This spine-tingling synopsis is just one of many engaging storylines provided by Hunt a Killer, delivering an incredible amount of fascinating narratives and clever cold cases once a month through their subscription-based, uniquely original game. You don't have to go diving into the darkest parts of the web to find bizarre and intriguing true crime stories to get your sleuthing fix in, because creative cases like the Julia Adler Files are delivered right to your home. There are realistic audio recordings, detailed suspect profiles, physical crime scene maps, murder weapon documents, and so much more packed into every murder mystery adventure. It's an experience unlike anything you've ever seen, as if a true crime-inspired escape room was built in your very own home. One of the most unique features about Hunter Killer is that part of the proceeds from every subscription box is awarded to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization passionate about assisting investigations with actual cold cases. This is especially meaningful to us, as our mission is first and foremost to bring awareness to victims and their cases. To help us do so, you can go to hunterkiller.com forward slash coldcasedetective and use the code coldcasedetective for 20% off your first box. Again, that is all caps coldcasedetective for a 20% discount to support the channel and support those affected by cold cases around the world. So let's light a torch and shine some light on the darkness as we team up to hunt a killer. Richard Call and Cassandra Haley. On April 19th, 1988, 20-year-old Richard Keith Hall, who went by his mill name, picked up 18-year-old Cassandra Lee Haley from her home in Grafton, Virginia. The pair planned on spending the entire evening together and traveled from the house to a movie theater in Keith's red 1982 Toyota. Afterwards, the pair attended a party at the University Square Apartments across from their shared school, Christopher Newport University in Newport News, Virginia. They were last seen together at around 1.30 a.m., where they left the party as Cassandra had a 2 a.m. curfew. However, no witnesses saw them after they left the building, and nobody knew where Keith had parked his car. No one saw the couple enter the vehicle, leaving the rest of their night shrouded in mystery. Keith's Toyota was found the following morning at 7 a.m. on April 10th. However, the vehicle was not reported to law enforcement until 9 a.m. It sat abandoned at the York River Overlook on Colonial Parkway in Yorktown, Virginia. The Colonial Parkway is a scenic parkway which extends for 23 miles, running through several Virginia cities, including Yorktown, Williamsburg, and Jamestown. And at the time of the couple's disappearance, it was thought to be the hunting ground 
of a serial killer. For this very reason, many people, including Keith's friends and family, found it odd that his vehicle was found here, as he knew to stay well clear of the route, especially at night. Nothing in the 20-year-old's Toyota seemed amiss, at least at first glance. The keys were in the ignition, and there was no blood nor any signs of a disturbance. A watch and a pair of eyeglasses were found on the car's dashboard, although it is unclear who the items belong to, as neither Keith nor Cassandra are shown wearing glasses in any of their photos. However, upon closer inspection, law enforcement officers found something odd. Most of Keith's clothing, including his underwear, were found in the back of his car, alongside most of Cassandra's clothing, which, again, included her underwear. Also left behind was Keith's wallet, which contained at least $20, Cassandra's handbag, and three shoes. One, belonging to the 18-year-old girl, was missing. Initially, investigators thought that the couple had gotten undressed to go swimming, but it ended up drowning. However, a search of the nearby river turned up nothing, and loved ones noted that Cassandra was afraid of water. However, scent dogs did pick up the couple's trail, leading down a steep 25-foot embankment to a small beach below. Despite this, the canines lost the trail, and an examination of the area with divers and officers on foot turned up no evidence and no leads. State police helicopters joined in the search, but found nothing. Meanwhile, the couple's families issued flyers throughout the state and offered a reward of $11,000 for information but none of the tips they received panned out. Cassandra's family searched the nearby woodland in the following weeks, but found no trace of her or her companion. As there was no blood, no sign of a struggle, and no physical evidence, authorities were left completely stumped, with more questions than answers. Had the car been dumped here by the perpetrator? Where were the couple, or what was left of them? Why was their clothing folded up, why was it left behind in the first place? And if the car had been dumped, why had the culprit chosen this location? In the years since the disappearance of Keith and Cassandra, there has been very little new information and no new evidence. Keith, an ordinary student with an interest in computing, had no known enemies. He met Cassandra in a maths class, and their date on the night they vanished was their first. Reportedly, Keith had recently split up with his girlfriend of four years, although one source states that the 20-year-old was simply on a break from his long-term partner. More recently, it has been theorized that the students fell victim to the serial killer we mentioned earlier. Between 1986 and 1989, three young couples, all of whom were university students, were found dead in the Colonial Parkway area. In all cases, their cars had been abandoned and their possessions left behind. However, if the pair are victims of the Colonial Parkway serial killer, then they are the only ones whose bodies have never been recovered. It has been suggested that the perpetrator posed as a law enforcement officer so they could get close to their victims. The slayings in the area stopped abruptly after 1989, however, leading some to believe that the culprit either died or went to prison. Others have theorized that the perpetrator was a worker at the CIA training grounds in Camp Peary, which can be found nearby. It's been suggested by online sleuths that the slaying stopped because the worker was transferred to another location. A retired homicide detective has suggested that the killings are not linked and are the work of separate people. However, all of these ideas are just theories and nothing more. Given Keith's knowledge of the previous murders and his reluctance to drive through the Colonial Parkway area, some have speculated that perhaps whatever happened to the couple took place along Route 17 and that the car had been dumped at the Colonial Parkway, possibly to throw off investigators. Other armchair detectives have proposed the idea that the couple's bodies were dumped into the York River and carried into Chesapeake Bay, never to be found. The case has not been easy, for the couple's loved ones. Of course, someone disappearing is a horrific thing to have to deal with, but Cassandra's family also voiced their concerns that not enough was done in the investigation. 
In 2018, they said they had felt abandoned by the FBI, who had primary jurisdiction because Keith's vehicle was found on federal property. The family noted that the authorities were more interested in arguing with one another over who had jurisdiction and that they failed to share information with each other, something that may have hindered the case. Meanwhile, Keith's father died in 1996 and his mother in 2001. His siblings continue to look for answers. Richard Keith Call and Cassandra Lee Haley were both seen alive at around 1.30 on the morning of April 10th, 1988. They had attended a party at the University Square Apartments in Newport News, Virginia. Keith is a white male with light brown hair and blue eyes. He is six foot tall and weighed around 150 pounds when he was last seen. At the time of his disappearance, he wore a gray and brown cardigan white polo shirt, two-tone brown dress slacks, and leather shoes. Cassandra is a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She is five foot seven and weighed around 135 pounds when last seen. She also has three piercings in her left ear and two in her right. At the time of her disappearance, she was wearing a long sleeve rust colored turtleneck with a white blouse over it stone-washed jeans, and a 1987 Tabs High School class ring. She may go by the nicknames Sandra, Sandy, Missy, and Cassie. If they are alive today, Keith would be 53 years old and Cassandra 52. If you have any information about the disappearance of Keith and Cassandra or their whereabouts, you can call the Virginia State Police Department on 804-674-20 Zero, zero. Mitchell Weiser and Benita Biquit. One of New York's most well-known missing persons cases is that of the two teenage lovers, Mitchell Weiser and Benita Biquit. At just 16 and 15 years old respectively, Mitchell and Bonnie were an extremely committed couple who had met over a year prior to their disappearance. In fact, they were so dedicated to one another that they had secretly exchanged wedding rings earlier in the summer of 1973. Both were intelligent and hardworking students who attended John Dewey High School, a Brooklyn alternative school for gifted students. Mitchell was due to graduate in January of 1974 and worked as a photography assistant at Chelsea Photographers in Coney Island. He lived in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Midwood and had a strong passion for both photography and poetry. Bonnie, meanwhile, worked at Camp Wellmet in Narrowsburg in the summer months, a camp for Jewish children about 90 miles outside of the city. When she wasn't working at the camp, she lived with her family in Borough Park. Both Mitchell and Bonnie came from stable, middle-class Jewish families. During her time at camp, Bonnie worked hard often completing 16 hour shifts. In a letter written to her parents, she said she enjoyed the freedom she experienced at the camp, noting she would like more independence when she returned home. It was July 27th of 1973 that events began spiraling out of control. The couple planned to hitchhike to The Summer Jam, a huge music festival featuring performances by the Almond Brothers Band, The Grateful Dead, and The Band, in Watkins Glen, New York. The gig once received a Guinness World Record for the largest audience at a pop festival, as an estimated 600,000 people attended that day. Mitchell and Bonnie had breakfast at Camp Wellmet before starting the 75 mile journey to Watkins Glen. The couple had $25 between them and had in their possession their backpacks, sleeping bags, and a cardboard sign with Watkins Glen written on it. Mitchell also carried a gray and olive green plaid flannel shirt. The teenagers were last seen hitchhiking along State Route 97. Reportedly, a truck driver who gave them a ride is the last confirmed person to have seen them. It is unclear if the pair ever made it to Watkins Glen, although many suspect not. Neither Bonnie nor Mitchell have ever been seen or heard from again. While both families had noted that the teenagers seemed off and uneasy in the weeks leading up to their disappearances, 
both agreed that they were normal, adolescent problems. One day, in the week before the vanishing, Bonnie snuck out of camp and returned home, where she collected $80 which she had been saving up so she could purchase a new bike. Although her family were not home at the time, neighbors witnessed the 15-year-old at the house. It was also discovered that she had actually quit her job on the day of her disappearance, reportedly in anger because her boss wouldn't let her have the day off, despite how hard she worked and the long hours she put in. As her parents were on holiday, they couldn't stop her from quitting, nor could they stop her from attending the festival. Meanwhile, Mitchell had been urged by his family not to attend the gig, as there was no easy way for him and Bonnie to travel there, and his parents did not want him hitchhiking. However, the 16-year-old ignored his family pleas and decided to go ahead with his plans. He was also upset at the time, as his parents were unable to afford to send him to his school of choice after he graduated, and instead, he'd have to attend a university closer to home. It was initially believed by law enforcement that the couple had run away together of their own volition, coming to this conclusion after discovering the issues they were having and that they'd exchanged wedding rings. However, both Bonnie and Mitchell's families disputed this idea. They believed the couple's problems were not so drastic that it would cause them to run away from home. To back up this idea, Bonnie's best friend, who was in Europe on holiday at the time, but exchanged letters with her, noted that the 15-year-old seemed normal in her writings and that nothing seemed amiss. Mitchell's family added that he was looking forward to getting his driver's license. He had his test scheduled for a few weeks after the date of his disappearance. Additionally, the couple's final paychecks were never collected, leaving them with minimal money to start a new life. Law enforcement also speculated that perhaps the bear had maybe joined a commune or gotten caught up in a cult. There have been few leads in the years since Bonnie and Mitchell were last seen. Mitchell's family moved to Arizona after the disappearance, although they kept a phone listing in the Brooklyn telephone directory in case the couple ever wanted to get in touch. Then in 1986, Mitchell's father, Sidney, accepted a collect call from a woman identifying herself as Bonnie. However, after Sydney greeted the woman, she hung up. Sydney fears that he had been too enthusiastic, which had scared the caller off, but online sleuths have wondered if the call had been a cruel prank. The woman never called back, and she has never been identified. In the months following the couple's vanishing, their families saw a glimmer of hope when Bonnie's mother received a letter from a Native American reservation in South Dakota. The letter asked her for a donation. Bonnie's mother told the media that the couple were very interested in Indian affairs. This led the families to wonder if the couple were living in a Native American community. Flyers were mailed to reservations and schools, but no leads ever came from this. In 2000, Classmates of the pair at John Dewey High School planted a tree and placed a memorial plaque at the establishment. This gesture drew interest from the local media and eventually prompted Governor Elliot Spitzer to reopen the case. This, in turn, led to a new witness stepping forward. Rhode Island resident Alan Smith was 24 years old on July 27th of 1973 and was reportedly making his way to the festival on a Volkswagen bus with Pennsylvania license plates. Although he can't remember the name of the driver, he recalls seeing a couple matching the descriptions of Bonnie and Mitchell on the bus with him. He also remembered that the couple had been discussing the girl's workplace, a summer camp. According to Alan, the foursome stopped to cool off in a river when Bonnie got into trouble in the water. Mitchell then jumped in after her and the two were swept away. There are mixed reports about what happened next. Some sources stated that Alan was told by the bus driver that he would make a call to emergency services at the next gas station, but authorities could find no record of such a call. Other sources have stated that neither Alan nor the driver ever called the authorities and never had any intention of doing such a thing. It is unclear why the two would not call for help. Reportedly, they had both been smoking marijuana, but that charge is an incredibly minor one to take in exchange for saving the lives of two teenagers. While initially, authorities deemed Alan's testimony as credible, 
They couldn't help but wonder why, as an athletic Navy veteran, he hadn't attempted to intervene and rescue the couple. The bus driver has never been located, and it's unclear in what river the foursome stopped at, as Alan has failed to recall the name or determine where it is. Later, when Alan was presented with photographs, he could not identify Bonnie and Mitchell. He also couldn't identify their clothing. He then refused a polygraph test, leading many to believe that he was lying about what he'd witnessed. In addition, no coroner's office was able to find any record of drowned individuals being found around that time. Over the years, the families of Bonnie and Mitchell have tried everything, from private investigators to psychics, and yet they still don't know the fates of their loved ones. Since their disappearances, the couple's social security numbers have never been used. The main theory in the case is that Bonnie and Mitchell fell victim to an unidentified killer who struck at random. It seems likely they got into the wrong vehicle on their way to Watkins Glen. Some have theorized that Bonnie was the prime target, as it is more often the case that females are attacked than men. However, this is mere speculation. Other online sleuths have suggested the idea that the couple were slain by Robert Garrow, a serial killer who was active in New York in the 1970s. In July of 1973, Garrow raped and killed 16-year-old Alicia Hawk, and then just three days later, killed 23-year-old Daniel Porter and 20-year-old Susan Petz in Weavertown. Then on July 29th, Garrow stabbed Philip Dombrowski to death at a campsite in Wells, Hamilton County. Garrow was ultimately killed in 1978, following an escape from a correctional facility. Much like the family of Cassandra Haley, the police were heavily criticized by the families of Bonnie and Mitchell for carrying out a lazy investigation. Reportedly, law enforcement failed to interview the couple's friends or camp goers at Bonnie's work in the weeks following the disappearances. Neither Bonnie's nor Mitchell's name was entered into the FBI's national database of missing people in the aftermath, and perhaps worst of all, the original case files were eventually lost. The files included the only copies of the couple's dental records. Mitchell and Bonnie were last seen alive on July 27th, 1973, in Narrowsburg, New York. Mitchell was 16 and Bonnie was 15. Mitchell is a white male with hazel eyes and brown hair, which was shoulder length and worn in a middle part. At the time of his vanishing, he was five foot seven and weighed 140 pounds. He was last seen wearing blue jeans, a t-shirt, boots, and gold-rimmed metal glasses. He has a scar on his lower lip, and his upper front teeth are discolored. He may go by the nickname Mitch. Bonita is a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt, and at that time was four foot 11 and weighed 90 pounds. Her nickname is Bonnie. If alive today, Mitchell would be 64 and Bonnie would be 63. If you have any information about the disappearance of Bonnie and Mitchell or their whereabouts, you can call the Sullivan County Sheriff's Department on 845-794-7100. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for as little as $2 a month. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.